Okay, in this lecture, we're going to talk about what economists believe. Um, it's a list of just 10 items. It's not necessarily comprehensive. I'm sure that some economists would like to put more items on the list, but I think it represents a good starting point. I was first introduced to a list like this by Professor Timothy Taylor, who uh, built a course entitled Economics Third Edition. It was a video course uh, designed uh, and published through the Great Courses, which was at the time known as the Teaching Company. And then uh, much later on, uh, Greg Mankiw of Harvard uh, popularized it in his uh, famous Principles of Economics book, um, which is now in its eighth edition. So let's walk through some of these. Let's just take a grand tour of, of the 10, starting with number one. People face trade-offs. Now, what do we mean by that? Simple. We mean that People face trade-offs all the time, that you give up one thing in order to get another thing. So for example, if the city of Houston were to say, well, we need to have more uh, neighborhood policing, well, that's expensive, right? And that may involve a lot more patrol cars, and it may involve having to hire a lot more police. And so you'll have to open up the police academy to more recruits. Well, if you spend more money on that, it means spending less money on something else. Now, of course, we might decide that that's worth it, but what might that something else be? That something else could be neighborhood parks where children could play, right? Or it could mean that uh, uh, we're not going to be able to spend as much money on our uh, fixing up our sewage treatment plant, right? There's a whole host of things that are involved there. Students make decisions all the time, whether to take chemistry over biology or whether to take college algebra or take a finite math course. And of course, those decisions have ramifications. There's, there's trade-offs. You do one thing, it means you can't do something else, right? And secondly, economists believe that when you think of cost, you should always think in terms of opportunity cost. And what opportunity cost means, in a nutshell, is what is the value of your next best available alternative? Now, I'll often be uh, uh, teaching in front of an early morning class, like an uh, 8 or 8.30 a.m. class and ask people, what is the opportunity cost of attending this class? And a lot of folks will raise their hands saying sleeping. And I sort of understand that. And I, I don't actually don't even think that's a silly answer. Yeah, you might have been able to sleep a little bit longer and that's the cost of coming here. Um, but is that the highest opportunity cost associated with being here? If it is, then that's the opportunity cost. But if it isn't, if it's really something else, like you could have worked an extra hour on your swing shift, maybe at a manufacturing plant wherever you are, out in Pasadena, well, then that's the opportunity cost. And then, of course, the, uh, if I would ask that same question at, at the 11.30 a.m. class and someone said sleeping, I'd be a little bit more skeptical about that kind of an answer because I'd say, well, really, are you going to be sleeping that late during the day? Um, so it's more than likely to be you know, something else. So costs are simply what you give up to get whatever it is that you're doing now. Those opportunity costs could be monetary but they also could be uh, non-monetary. Now, in the case of a college student, the biggest cost of going to college for most college students is not the tuition, it's not the fees, it's not the books, believe it or not. It's the income that you gave up, especially for full-time college students who are choosing not to work. Now, granted, if you go to college right out of high school, the opportunity cost is going to be fairly low maybe about eighteen dollars to $20,000 a year in a lost retail job that you could have had. Um, but that's still very real. And if you take that and multiply it times four, that's $72,000. And that's certainly not a small change. The third thing is rational people think at the margin. Very few people make total decisions in their lives, meaning global decisions. Oh, gee, on January 1st, I'm going to do all these things, buy this many shirts, this many jackets buy this car and buy this much gasoline and go to the movie theaters this many times, et cetera, et cetera. That's very odd. Human beings are not like that. We tend to operate at the margin, right? What are we going to do next, right? So in other words, we're typically uh, weighing the marginal benefit of a decision versus the marginal cost. The marginal benefit is just the extra added benefit of doing something versus the extra added cost that I incur. And if that extra added benefit a little bit more than the marginal cost of doing it, then I do it. But if the marginal cost exceeds the marginal benefit, it doesn't make any difference that there's a marginal benefit because the cost 
I'm incurring to do it wipe more than wiped out the marginal benefit. And so I think that's also an important concept as well. And then fourth, people respond to incentives, right? A uh, great example of this would be in a college classroom. Let's just say that I gave three, exam three exams, three midterm exams, they're worth, let's say, 50%, and uh, let's say a final exam worth 25%, so that's 75%. And then let's say that uh, I had, you know, I've got 25%, let's, let's say 20% is, is homework, and then 5% on essays. Now, how hard are students going to work on those essays if they're only worth 5%? Well, a rational student is going to respond to the incentive and say, gee, my incentive is to spend more time on those things that are worth a lot more and spend less time on those things that are worth a lot less to me. So when professors are upset because of how students respond, uh, it's not so much the student's fault, but it's the fault of the professor and the kind of incentive structures that they've put forward to the student. Now, the other thing is the kind of incentives really matter, and they matter a lot. Uh, and one of the examples that I give, which is a counterintuitive example, is a case of blood donation. Now, back in the 1970s in the city of Chicago, they were discovering that blood donations were down. And so they hired a consultant to help them to figure out a plan of attack, what they could do about getting the blood donations up. And it turned out that they had a fairly simple recommendation. Pay people to donate blood. That makes sense. People respond to incentives, right? Well, not too far into the campaign, uh, they started observing blood donations, and blood donations plummeted like 40%. Wow, Ikes, that wasn't supposed to happen, right? Well, it turned out when they started to interview people, when they started to interview men and women about why they chose not to donate blood, well, many of them says, well, I didn't donate blood to get money. I donated blood because I was trying to do some good uh, for somebody who might need my blood. And I was ashamed that if I entered the facility and somebody saw me, it was because I needed the money. <laughs> and right, so in that case, it's not so much that incentives don't matter, it's just that it's the wrong incentive. And we have to remember we're dealing with human beings. We're not dealing with robots and we're not dealing with animals. Human beings have feelings, we have an ethical code, which of course animals don't share. And um, that, that can uh, cause real problems when we don't think carefully about how to frame those incentives. Number five, trade can make everyone better off. I have a, a fun exercise that's more of a thought experiment than a real experiment, but I like to tell my students, look, let's take all your personal effects and put them on, on, on the desk in front of you. And then let's stand up and then walk around the room and see if you can strike up a bargain with some of your fellow classmates. And of course, if you like something that somebody else has, you could make a pitch to say, hey, look, I'll give you my textbook for your, uh, your, your iPad or vice versa. That doesn't sound like a really good deal, does it? Uh, or, you know, maybe I have this fancy pen and you're going to agree to give me your notebook or something like that. Or maybe you look around the room and you're happy with what you got and you don't see anything of interest uh, in, possession, uh, in the possession of your classmates. You can choose not to make a trade. But a lot of folks are probably going to make a trade, right? Now, why do you make a trade? You only make a trade if you think you'll be made better off by the trade. No one makes a trade such that, in the end, it's going to make them worse off, at least not wittingly. And so, if that's the case, that means every trade that's made made everybody just a little bit better off. Well, if you sum up all those net benefits, that means the total wealth or well-being of that classroom has improved by this, by this little experiment, this little transaction. So uh, that's a very powerful concept. Number six, it says markets are a good way to organize economic activity. Uh, a qualifier here would be markets are a useful way to organize an economy or can be a useful way to organize an activity, economic activity. It doesn't mean it's the only way and it doesn't mean that it's the best way. It just happens to work out really nicely. Um, why is that? Well, it turns out that with markets, we can get lots of stuff through markets rather than having to rely on other mechanisms to make it happen. In other words, rather than having to worry about uh, sort of command and control, sort of some kind of centralized government to dictate uh, which goods get produced and who gets them and worrying about the distribution problems, uh, 
markets can be a, a great way of, of, of taking care of, of, of how goods and services are produced and who gets them without necessarily some guiding force. Now, that doesn't mean that they're, they're useful in every way. There may be lots of economic problems that cannot be tackled specifically uh, with the use of a market, and it may require other types of intervention. Seven, and this is related to number six, government can sometimes improve market outcomes. And I think most economists are in favor of government intervention in a limited area where there are either A, spillover costs or spillover benefits. Now, I'd like to just focus on the first one, spillover costs. What is that? Well, the spillover cost is a cost that a third party incurs as a result of somebody else's action. Pollution is a classic example of that. Let's think about a very simple pollution, noise pollution. So let's say I have a party at my home and I'm playing the music very loud. Well, in a sense, I'm imposing a cost on my neighbors because of this loud music. Now, there are ways of fixing that problem. The neighbor could just knock on my door and say, hey, by the way, I don't know if you're aware of this, but your music is really loud. And, uh, you know, if I were a nice guy, it's recognize that, I'm reasonable, I turn down the, turn down the volume. Um, that's a, a sort of innocuous case, but suppose that uh, it was something else. Suppose that, you know, I decide I want to put uh, pink flamingos in my front yard and keep a snowman there 365 days out of the year. Well, I, I've in a sense imposed a cost on all my neighbors. Yeah, I like pink flamingos and a snowman, but everybody else has to drive by it and see that ugly spectacle. Now, we do have ways of dealing with that. Civic associations are probably, or, or I should say, uh, homeowners associations, HOAs, are probably the, the lowest level or smallest level of political uh, entities. And they have things called uh, deed restrictions, which they can enforce and say, hey, look, you can't do that. And you get a nasty little letter from the lawyer saying, please remove your pink flamingo and your snowman, except for maybe around Christmas time. So governments can sometimes improve markets, and of course, pollution that goes across city borders or state borders or across national borders, there we can see an argument for why government might want to be involved, either through taxing or but through cap and trade, and et cetera, et cetera. A whole host of ways in which the government could maybe make the market better. And then last, or, or last at least on this list, a country's standard of living depends on the ability to produce goods and services, right? That if a country is productive and has a big, uh, high qualified labor force that's highly skilled and it has access to uh, raw materials, it can be uh, very prosperous, right? Now, it doesn't have to have all those things. It can sometimes import some of those things, but it has to have some kind of ability to produce goods and services, right? So, a classic example of that would be Japan. Japan has uh, very few natural resources, especially with regard to energy, it has to import all of its energy, it has to import practically all of its wood, right? Yet, because it's a highly skilled labor force, it's a very productive and powerful economy. Okay, let's look at number nine. It says, prices rise when the government prints too much money. Now, in this case, by government, we mean the Federal Reserve, which is the central bank. This makes sense. In fact, most economists don't have any trouble with this. They, they look at this as fairly uncontroversial principle. Um, not everyone who is a non-economist necessarily would agree, but essentially, the old adage is too much money chasing after too few goods results in a bidding up of the price of those goods. Uh, that's a sort of back of the envelope explanation. When you get into the macro course, you'll have a more sophisticated explanation. And incidentally, the government doesn't really go around printing money to expand the money supply, but it does so uh, through the manipulation of, uh, of reserves by injecting new reserves into the banking system, electronic reserves. Uh, but essentially, it amounts to the same thing as if the government actually did print money. Now, of course, the government does have to print money to uh, replenish uh, old bills that are destroyed, but that's not really what we're talking about in number nine. All right, number 10, it says society faces a short run trade off between unemployment and inflation. What that means is in the short run, it might be possible, right, to um, lower the inflation rate, but you might experience a little bit of unemployment by doing that. But why? Because you might have to engage in uh, tight monetary policy, 
right, which may cause interest rates to rise, which will choke off the inflation, but it result in a little bit higher unemployment. Or if you use fiscal policy, you could increase taxes or cut government spending or a combination of the two. And those policies could result in, you know, abating the inflation, but cause some discomfort on the unemployment side. The unemployment numbers would go up. But what economists are saying here is, in the short run, that may be true. But in the long run, uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy doesn't really have any impact uh, on, on that trade-off. In other words, the argument is that in the long run, there is no trade-off between unemployment and inflation. Okay, that's pretty much it for today, for what economists believe, and I'll see you next time.